Hi guys, I'm Dr. Doug Polster, sports psychologist. Welcome to part three of our ACL rehab and recovery series. Today, we're gonna to talk about being psychologically ready once your surgeon and your PT tell you they're ready to get back on the field. So we're gonna talk about four different things today. First, understanding the psychosocial factors that impact return to sport. So what does psychosocial factors even mean? Then we're gonna talk about assessing your own mental readiness to return to sport. Uh, third, we're gonna talk about developing that return to sport mindset, or I call the challenge mindset. And finally, what is a sports psychologist and what is their role in this ACL rehabilitation process? Before we even jump into things though, I want you to take a good look at this slide. I want you to know that it's not just UCLA Health that thinks this is a good idea to have sports psychology involved, but this is a group, a slide put out by an international group of experts in sports physical therapy in 2016. What you'll notice about the factors that they found that influence return to play is you've got your injury characteristics here, right? This is the injury itself. You've got your physical factors, but most importantly, you also have your psychological and social factors that interfere with or can help or hinder the return to sport process. So it's not just us at UCLA Health that think this matters. And this is from an international group of experts as well that understand the importance of the psychosocial factors that influence our return to sport. So what are those factors? Let's start out with psychological. We've got motivation, we've got confidence, depression, anxiety, the perception of how we believe this injury will affect our lives. And all these form together to form what can potentially be a vicious risk cycle. So for example, if even before you have surgery, you're focused mostly on the extrinsic or external motivating factors of your sport. So the trophy, doing it for the money, doing it for the fame. Those things tend to make injury recovery a bit more complicated and we're less likely to push through our rehab versus the athletes who find intrinsic or internal motivation in participating in their sport. So they're doing it for pride, to develop as an individual, to be a better teammate. Those athletes tend to have a less complicated, less stressful recovery. So if you look at the risk cycle here, let's, let's start first here with perception. If we perceive, or if you perceive that your injury is the worst thing that could ever possibly happen in your entire life, getting out of the gate, feeling a little bit down about yourself and a little bit overwhelmed with the process. If we feel that this is the worst thing that's ever happened to us, we may lose motivation. If we lose motivation, we tend to lose confidence. If we lose confidence over time, we start to feel worried or more frustrated or overwhelmed or anxious. A lot of what frustration and feelings of overwhelmed and anxiety can then lead us to feel depressed or down or not getting pleasure out of the things that we used to. And all that reinforces the idea that this is the worst thing that's ever happened to us. And so starting off the injury process, understanding that you know, how we are perceiving this injury is really important to getting off the rehab on the right foot and getting back to return to sport in the best time frame possible. Next, the social factors. We'll start with pressure. And that's not just personal pressure to return to play, but also family and coaches pressure. So parents out there, I know you never pressure your kids to perform at sports at the level that you'd want them to. What I mean here is that sometimes over a nine to 12 month recovery process, parents can accidentally pressure their kids into feeling the need to get back really quickly or feeling the need to get back in perfect shape. And so it's something that I will ask my parents to be consciously aware of and also to work with coaches on is let's not add extra pressure uh, to this recovery process. Next, we have future goals. And I ask my surgeons, my PTs, and my families to keep all this in mind. So if you are using your sport to get a college scholarship, right, or maybe to even play in professional leagues, and then you have an ACL injury, Right? That's a big blow to confidence. That's a big blow to the potential ego and your potential future. Right? Also financially. And so if you're getting a college scholarship, right, that's a big weight off your shoulders financially. Or if you're expecting to be drafted in the first round of the NFL draft and then your ACL goes out, right, that's another big financial pressure that can be put on you. So that's all part of this social aspect of the injury recovery. 
And finally, one of the questions I ask my athletes to answer themselves is, what is your athletic identity? On a scale of zero to 100, how much do you identify as a football player, as a soccer player? Typically, the athletes that answer close to 100%, so I'm a football player and there's nothing else, are more affected by the injury because there's not much else to their identity but their identity as an athlete. So asking yourself that question early on is a good way to judge how much this injury is really going to affect you, especially from the psychological standpoint. So let's look at assessing your own mental readiness to return to sport a bit closer. So the first question I want you to ask yourself is, do you truly believe your medical team? And so your surgeon in PT may have told you you're physically clear to get back on the field. But if you don't fully believe them, the answer to that question is no. Then we have to figure out why. What is holding you back? Because that will then give ammo and to the physicians that, and the PT that are helping you return to play, give you the answers that you may need to hear to feel more psychologically ready to play. Next, do you feel pressure to return in peak shape? If the answer to that is yes, where is that pressure coming from? If it's coming from family or coaches, then we know where to assess it and hopefully we can remove some of that pressure. Third, how close to healed do you really feel? Again, the closer to 100%, the more mentally ready you are to get back on the field. But if you're below 80 to 90%, then you may be more likely to be tentative, which can actually put you at more risk of injury. So if you're in that area, we need to figure out why. And lastly, if you had to play tomorrow, how tentative would you be? With zero meaning I'm ready to rock, no issues, and 100 being if I paid you a million dollars, you wouldn't get back on the field. All right, the farther we stray from zero and the closer to 100 you are, the more likely to be, you are to play tentative, the more likely that you don't believe you've healed, and the more work we have to put in on getting you psychologically ready to get back on the field. So how do we develop that return to sport mindset so that you are psychologically ready? And the answers to those questions are more helpful and help you to get back on the field. So first, that psychologically mindedness and return to sport mindset starts at prehab. The first thing I have my athletes do, and it's very, very hard, and families are included in this, is let's do our best to remove that long-term time frame from the equation. So I know you want to know when you're going to be back to play. And you want to hear it's going to be 10 months, 4 days, and 6 hours. But early on, we don't truly know how long this is going to take and how your body is going to respond. So let's remove that hardcore time frame and that pressure that that causes. And let's create what I call a structured but flexible timeline. And what does that mean? So that means let's break the recovery into chunks. Let's look at the prehab as an area. Then let's look at post-surgery week one, then week two, then month one, then month two, and month three, four, five, and so on. And let's see how all these exercises build on each other to create the strength and stability to get you back to that long-term goal of return to play. One of the best ways to do this is to get it out of our own heads and write it down. So I have all my athletes write down a hierarchy of what their exercises are designed to do. So you may say, oh, what's the point of just doing a single leg balance? Or why am I doing body squats? Well, the surgeon probably told you and your PT probably told you it's to build muscle, right? To get back to return to play. But sometimes that single body squat is so far off to return to play that it can be demotivating in and of itself. So I ask my, my athletes to draw this to show that I do squats, I do single leg balance, I do lunges, all so that I can get to the point that I can do a single leg squat. Because once I do a single leg squat, now I can get back to jogging. And jogging is a key step in getting back to cutting and getting back in return to play. So visually seeing the steps it's going to take and why we're doing the exercise can really help with motivation. And finally, put this in your room. I tell my athletes, keep it on your phone, put it on the mirror in your bathroom, put it on your nightstand, in areas that you can constantly be reminded to stay motivated, to put in the work, to work through this hierarchy to get to the place you need to be, to get psychologically ready to return to sport. All this ties into motivation. 
As we talked in part two of the webinar series with Carol, rehab can be boring. Okay? So how do we stay motivated? How do we put in the work for those 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes a day that we need to do to get our leg and knee ready to return to sport? And the first thing I talk about is what I call mindless rehab. How can we add our rehab to our normal day-to-day -day life without having to take any extra time to do it? And one of the best ways to do this is while you're watching TV. So if you're watching an hour TV show with your family, every time there's a commercial, get up and do some exercises. If you're watching Netflix or Amazon Prime and there aren't any commercials, set a phone timer to go off every five to 10 minutes and do some exercises. For those of you that enjoy video games, this is another great opportunity to do mindless rehab. So talk to your PT about whether you can do some exercises sitting down, and if not, maybe you play Fortnite standing up for the next few weeks as you do some of your standing leg squats. And finally, or second to last, adding rehab to your daily activities can also help to remove that extra time added of doing exercises. So if you have to go to PE class and you can't participate, that's a great opportunity to do some exercises. If, you, if we're encouraging you to go watch practice even though you can't play, that's a great time to do your exercises. And lastly, for our parents out there, creating a, re a reward system can be super helpful, especially for our younger athletes. So if you do X amount of exercises, you may get Y amount more time of video game playing. If you do A amount of exercises, you may get a B extension on your curfew. All right, so all that is going to be family specific, but can help with motivation. And finally, let's talk about sports psychology. Sports psychology is becoming more and more mainstream, and a lot of times people associate it with performance. I want to swim faster, I want to run faster, I want to shoot better free throws. But sports psychologists also have a role in injury recovery. So if you're going through these questions that we've been talking about in part three, and you're asking yourself, am I ready? Am I, am I tentative? Am I sure I'm healed? And your answers to those questions are no. I'm not quite sure if I'm healed. I am still in pain. You know, I am still frustrated. I do feel tremendous pressure. Well, the first thing I want you all to realize is that that's completely normal. There is no such thing as a perfect recovery. The frustration and worry and demotivation and tentativeness all is a natural part of the recovery process. If you find yourself getting held back from that, and not wanting to do your exercises, or you've been cleared and yet you don't feel psychologically ready to get back on the field because of some of these things, then that's the time to work with a sports psychologist. So as a sports psychologist, what do I do to help athletes overcome some of those mental challenges of getting back on the field? Well, first off, we work on helping to retrain the brain on how it perceives the injury and also how it perceives pain. And so as we talked about in part two, pain doesn't always mean re-injury. Pain can mean we're doing an exercise wrong. So helping the brain to recognize those subtle differences helps to alleviate some pressure. Also, we can develop motivation through putting together small action plans day by day that help create positive momentum. I like to visualize this as an avalanche of positivity. So each daily action is like a piece of snow falling down the mountain. And as they move more and more through the rehabilitation process, they move farther down the mountain, they gain more steam and more positivity follows. Sports psychologists can also help you just cope with that frustration, some of that anxiety, and especially once you've been cleared, that fear of re-injury, which is totally natural. The last time you made that cut on the field, your knee blew out, and you were sidelined for almost a year. So being a little bit concerned about getting back to, the, to sport is absolutely normal and natural, and sports psychologists can help you cope with that and overcome it. Ultimately, the goal is to take control of your injury pro recovery process back. Over the length of a nine to 12 month and beyond recovery, it can feel like your injury is controlling your life. And so sports psychologists can help you regain that control with the ultimate goal of getting back on the field and getting into peak performance. So before we finish up, I wanna go through a few questions that you can ask your PT and your surgeon when you go in for clearance or all the way back to the initial evaluation. So first, 
Work with your PT and say, you know, can you help me outline the steps in rehabilitation that build on each other? So creating that hierarchy that builds on each other to remove the pressure of that long-term goal of return to play and bring it back to the present and focusing on the process. Second, you know, what happens if myself or for parents, my child experiences pain or discomfort after they've been cleared? And alongside that, how do I know if pain or discomfort is a bad thing? Okay. That information it not only helps you, but can also inform a sports psychologist for what we can actually get you back into doing and how can we help you become more comfortable being uncomfortable. Next, are there any pieces of equipment uh, that I can use for my son or my daughter or myself in the, at home to help with my home-based exercises for my physical therapist? And finally, you know, if I think I'm having some of those mental obstacles to getting over my injury, fear or anxiety or motivation challenges. As the surgeon or the PT, do you have any recommendations for a sports psychologist or even clinical psychologist to help me push through the last psychological frontier of getting back out onto the field? And so I hope some of these questions will be good ammo for you guys to bring to your surgeons and your PT to help make the process a little bit easier to help add more knowns and take away the unknowns and again, help to regain the control over your injury recovery process. So this wraps up part three of our webinar series. I'm now gonna bring in my colleagues, Dr. Beck and Carol Netter to have a round table discussion a bit more about how can you be psychologically ready to return to sport. Welcome back. I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Jennifer Beck, orthopedic surgeon specializing in sports medicine, pediatrics, and Carol Netter, physical therapist, orthopedic certified specialist. And so now we're gonna have an open discussion about being psychologically minded and getting ready to get back on the field. So the first question that comes to me when I see my patients is, is cleared all or nothing? And how do I know that I'm really ready to go back? What should I be looking for from my doctors? And so I'll kick that guys to you. Is it all or nothing cleared? Is it a zero to 100? Take me through that. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting thing because we've really transitioned our thinking. Before, uh, surgeries was really about timelines and deadlines and oh, it's six months to the day, great, go do things. We realized that was probably very bad and turned into a lot more injuries and re-injuries because that didn't mean anybody was ready. And just the ticking clock doesn't mean that you are ready or not. Kind of a general time frame that I talk with my patients about is somewhere around the three month mark is when we'll start getting you running or jogging. That's usually a big step for people, especially for a lot of these sports that involved the cutting and pivoting involve running. And that's a really sign that people see, okay, I'm starting to make some progress. So you're gonna be cleared for just starting to do running straightforward inline things. That's really a time I start also discussing with patients this transition from surgery recovery to becoming an athlete again, because I think a lot of people day by day realize I'm walking around, going up and down stairs. My day by day is great. Why can't I just go play soccer? Yeah. Why can't I go play in a tournament? And you have to really talk with them that this clearance is really a progression from that three to nine, 12 month, that step by step, you're gonna be doing more and more. So it's cleared in steps. It's cleared in steps. And we have some very specific markers of strength that we look for on our return to sport testing, on our physical exams that tell us, are you ready to be doing those things? And so it really is a gradual progression, not just here's your piece of paper, go play. Got it. So Carol, <clears throat> similarly, as you get through that progression, what are you looking for in terms of clearance steps? And then what is that final, you're good to go, we're ready to rock, get back on the field, go, full, go play full time? Well, the, the initial clearance is going to come after you've passed some sort of return to sport testing where you've been graded on the quality of your movement and different scores on, on tests. Um, and to me, that initial clearance means, okay, your rehab is done. You don't have to come to the therapy gym and do your cutting and jumping anymore. Now you get to go in the field and you're not worried about thinking about cutting, you're worried you're getting to play with the ball and you might cut as you're dealing with the ball, right? So in the, in the beginning, you, you're, you're cleared to go and practice again, to handle the ball, to handle a, a drill, a sports specific drill, running a play by yourself, non-contact, no mm -hmm. one's around you. Um, then you get into some 
practice scenarios, again, non-contact non scenarios where you're practicing, maybe everyone's going through that same drill. You know, you, you do your drill, do the skill, and then run to the back of the line and do the skill again. So basically that first stage is, oh, I don't have to worry about actually what I'm doing. I'm just worrying about the skill of the game now gotcha. because I've gotten the structural uh, foundation of the cut or the landing or the jump. Okay. Um, and normally I, I expect that that's about four weeks of that transition mm -hmm. um, before you then get to go into contact practice, meaning you're in a situation where somebody might nudge you or, mm -hmm. or bump you. Um, and so that's the progression we have, uh, and it's hard because there's no there's no no hard and fast rules for that progression. Really, that period, that four eight week period before you get to go play your first game again. Yeah. Um, at UCLA, we're partnered with Exos, and this is a facility, a training facility, a sports training facility, and they have um, equipment and facilities and and and, and mock fields um, where they do have trainers that sort of help you return to that skill set again. Um, but other, as you mentioned before, other kids are lucky enough to have programs like that at school. They have trainer ac access to trainers um, at home or school or a coach that they worked with before might do some one-on-one -on -one things with them. So that's that's what's happening in that period. So what I'm hearing then is that the, the unknown is now the known. So I think that's one of the challenges in that last final stage is how long does this last? How long should I be just doing drills alone before I can get back into play? And so I think having our, our, our viewers and our kids that are watching this understand that that's normal to not really know and for mm -hmm. it to be a touch and feel scenario and that there is no hard rule can help alleviate some stress. Because mm -hmm. that's one of the, the biggest challenges that I see in working with patients is there's a lot of unknowns, there's not a lot of hard set rules, and that creates gray areas. And our brains aren't very good at gray areas. We don't deal with yeah. that well. We're grasping for straws. So hopefully through some of this conversation, we can provide a couple more knowns to our, our patients so they can feel a little bit more at ease and more relaxed and less frustrated. I tell you what, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, one known, um, whether you're in physical therapy, running those cuts and, and jumps and decelerations, uh, or you're going to the field to practice alone or drills, um, one benchmark you can look for is, am I doing this at 100% speed? Am I going at that cone full speed? Because in the gym, with therapy, you're probably doing 85%, 90% speed, and that's just the constraints of the space, too. Mm -hmm. But when you know that you're really going after it full speed and you're doing those drills, then you, you, that's a benchmark of feeling, feeling confident that you're ready to go back to sport. That's a great point. And that's one of the things that a sports psychologists will help uh, their patients recognize is if I'm not going 100%, what is holding me back? It's typically not your PT or your surgeon at that point <laughs> saying don't go 100% or we wouldn't be having the conversation. So chances are it's something about fear of re-injury um, or there's an image that pops up in your mind that last time I went 100%, this thing blew out and that scares you. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes sense. It should be a little bit uh, nerve wracking. And so what the sports psychologist can do is we work with, with you to help identify what is actually holding you back and then help to remove that as an obstacle. And once we do, then frustration is limited, fear is limited, and then you can really go actually put your knee to the test and get out there and do 100%. And I think one of the other things that's very helpful dealing with that unknown is, you know, you have this soccer athlete, maybe they were a year round travel team, their goal is getting back to soccer, but there's lots of other things. Can they skateboard? Can they wakeboard? Can they hike? Yeah. And so I think one of the things at the end of my clinical visits that I really make a point of is saying, what are the things you can do besides soccer? Are there other things that you could be doing in a physical activity that are a-okay? Should you be on a motorized scooter going 15 miles an hour <laughs> six weeks after a surgery? Should you be, you know, because those are yeah. things that are in day-to-day -day life that when I think of the biomechanics of what they're doing, I have to evaluate, are they ready for that? Because there are so many activities out there besides that one sport they got injured in. So I would definitely say if you're having those visits with your doctor, ask them about those other things. If you, can you be jumping on a trampoline? Can you be running with your dog in the park? What about tetherball? Um, those different things, some of them you'll be able to do before you'll play soccer and so that you can find you know, decrease those unknowns so that you do know what you can and can't do. Makes sense. 
I think the, the final question I wanted to ask you guys, and since you're both involved at different uh, areas and time frames on, in the recovery process from, from diagnosis to prehab to rehab and beyond, where do you guys find what I'll call the psychological stuck points? Areas where frustration increases or motivation decreases or anger pops up um, or even maybe more anxiety or depression pop up. Are there certain time points that we can you know, let the audience know to be, to be on the lookout for that A, it's normal to happen during that time frame, but also B, here's what we can do to support it. And maybe I can answer the supporting fr- yeah. aspect of it once you guys give us an idea of maybe some of those key, key time frames where those things pop up. So I think the two that I really see are around that three month mark where they're back to day to day activities. They've already been in therapy for three months. They're feeling pretty good and we're starting to progress them. And I'm telling them, hey, you still have work that needs to be done. We're still very early in this cycle. And I think that's when just a lot of burnout happens. They lose some motivation. They're wondering why they're doing this. Three months is a very long time to go through rehab and injury and to think that you have another six or nine months potentially ahead of you. And so sometimes starting that up can be a very difficult time. I think the second time I see it is once they get into that six or eight month time frame where we're getting so close to getting them back um, that really emphasizing that transition, not only of getting back to sports, but also prevention, um, hesitancy, should I even be going back to this sport? I've worked all this time. I don't want to have to do this again ever in my life. Um, and just some of those hesitancies. I think that the, the losing motivation around the three to four month point and then really get that getting back of should I be doing this? Am I okay? Are the two big times I see. Yeah. You stole my hand. Because <laughs> I would say those, those two time frames are, are the same. I experienced it a little differently. Uh, I talked about in my talk at around week 16, we're starting to do ballistic training, right? So you set a little uh, obstacle in front of someone and say, okay, you're going to jump up onto that platform. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they look at something that's six inches high off the ground and it just looks like a mountain Mm because they they go down and they just realize that, oh, this is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Or you get on the treadmill to jog for the first time and, and, you know, you just... Yeah. You feel you kind of feel lopsided because you're not really hitting the ground correctly on the on the involved mm-hmm. side, and so that reality of oh, yeah, this I'm not yeah. normal yet. That that's a blow I think. Mm-hmm. And and again, like I mentioned, um, doing some testing around the six month mark, um, to because sometimes you have to show somebody how bad they are. Like you, we video them. I'm gonna take a, a shot of you running up to do this cut and I want <laughs> I want you to see how the proofs in the you know yeah. yeah yeah and um and so to you know what I find is a problem of not of not so much um the discouragement or discourage of feeling like they can't do what they can do but somebody thinking that they can do more than they they can and so you kind of have to show them look no you really have to practice this you yeah. I know you're a good athlete you know, you're a really good athlete and you're used to practice and skills coming easily to you. But that's, uh, but here's a, a moment, mm-hmm. maybe be the first moment in time where they really have to work at something yeah. if they're really a talented athlete, yeah. you know? That makes sense, and yeah. that And that's tough. Yeah. Um, so I think the video of the shot really can, can help bring them back to ground and, and refocus them to, to say, okay. And, and then also just, what to do about it is say, look, you know, this is what we're going to do. Week one, week two, week three, in the next month, so that the next time we video this, it looks a lot better. And then you just gotta keep things, yeah. keep bringing the keep zooming out. Look at the big picture. Bringing them back to a timeline. You got to do this, and we're gonna do this, and we're gonna do this, and and that making those little steps kind of keeps them keeps them going because they they know they're one step closer you know? mm-hmm. makes sense makes sense as a sports psychologist i typically see patients on either side of that spectrum either super hesitant or super overconfident <laughs> right and both of them both of those both those patients can be challenging because they're putting themselves at risk. One's putting them at at risk of re-injury, and one's putting themselves at risk of prolonged recovery. And so both of those uh, mindsets are things that sports psychologists can help work on. So how do we pull back the reins on the the person who's overconfident, and how do we sort of activate 
the person who's feeling a little hesitant. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the important thing that I'm taking out of this whole process so far has been that these are normal reactions. Right? You sure. are going to feel demotivated. Mm -hmm. You are going to feel overconfident at times. You're going to feel underconfident at times. Those are all normal reactions. Um, but once those reactions stay around too long and interfere with your ability to actually participate in your rehab or get back to sport, as I've said a few times, that's when they become challenging. And that's when they become something that we can actually rehabilitate in and of themselves to help remove those mental obstacles to getting through your recovery and getting back onto the field. And so one, I think, final point I'll make here is that as you go through this nine to 12 month recovery process, and you guys see them at all different phases, and I see them sometimes at prehab, and mostly more towards return to sport, mm -hmm. but this is a really challenging process that also is glass half full, confidence building. So you've been over, you've been able to conquer this immense challenge of nine to 12 months of rehabilitation, of dealing with frustration, of dealing with motivation challenges, of dealing with stress and frustration. And you've come out on the under, other end of it successful. And so what I tell my athletes is at the end, write down your own story. Write down that story of how scared and angry and frustrated you were at diagnosis. What did it feel like when you came out of surgery? What did those first few weeks of rehab feel like? What did it feel like to lose motivation and to feel frustrated? But then end it with that positive note. Look backwards. How strong, how much stronger do you feel now? How much more confident do you feel in your abilities to tackle an seemingly overwhelming, insurmountable challenge? And I tell all my athletes that throughout your athletic career, you're going to be faced with adversity. You're going to be faced with challenges, not just injuries, but difficult teams, difficult weather, uh, getting into college, playing professional. All of those at the moment may seem insurmountable or may seem like something you can't do. But you've just gone through this really rigorous, intense process where you've put your body through a lot and come out the other side. So actually writing that down, putting that in a box, putting it in your memory bank, and revisiting it next time you come through or come across a challenging situation can be really, really helpful to help with that challenge mindset and to help yourselves push through and overcome the next set of challenges. So that way this ACL recovery process isn't just getting you back to play, but it's also setting a strong mental foundation for the next challenges that you're gonna undoubtedly encounter at some point in your life. So thank you guys for having the three of us together to talk about all this, it's been a blast. And I'm excited that we were able to put this together. Thank you.